The rugged topography of the western U.S. is known for its scenic and iconic mountain ranges such as the Cascades, the Sierra Nevada, the Rocky Mountains, and even smaller ranges like the Bighorn Mountains and the Wind River Range. Yet among the hundreds of mountain ranges in the western U.S., one stands out as a complete oddball. Notice that by and large most of the mountains trend northerly, sometimes more northeast or northwest, but generally the mountains run north-south. Yet the biggest outlier of this trend is the east-west trending Uinta Range of northeastern Utah. In this video, we'll explore the fascinating geologic history that explains why the Uintas run east-west. But before we do, let's take a look at this interesting mountain range. So the Uinta Mountains span about 100 miles from east to west in this part of northeastern Utah. They run almost at a 90 degree counter angle to the Wasatch Range, which runs mostly north-south here around Salt Lake City and the Great Salt Lake. Elevations in the Uinta Mountains range from about 8,000 to a little over 13,000 feet. And they also include the tallest peak in Utah, which is Kings Peak. This mountain range is also significant because it forms the headwaters of several major rivers that feed the Great Salt Lake, most of which flow from the western and northern edge of the mountains, the Weber, Provo, and Bear Rivers. Like a lot of the tall mountains in the Intermountain West, this area was heavily glaciated during the last glacial maximum around 15,000 years ago. And the rocks of the Uinta Mountains contain rocks that you find nowhere else, which makes it particularly captivating. This is a graphic showing where glaciers were in the Uintas during the last glacial extent about 32,000 years ago. You can see these tongue glaciers coming down the drainages, the crest of the Uintas running right through this region here. Um, these glaciers formed large U-shaped valleys which are still visible today. And the ice in the Hyatt country carved uh, narrow ridges, bowl-shaped depressions, and jagged peaks, creating just a fascinating wonderland of high alpine terrain in this glacial setting. So, now let's dig into the story of the Uinta Mountains by starting way back in the Precambrian, about 2 billion years ago, when Western North America was growing due to collisions between small crustal blocks. One such collision occurred right along the southern edge of the Wyoming Craton and is called the Cheyenne Suture Zone. You can see this also is where the Uinta Mountains are today. So during this time in the Precambrian, we had blocks of continental crust that were colliding along various subduction zones, amalgamating together, and eventually growing our continent larger and larger. Now, these suture zones, like the Cheyenne Suture Zone here, contain faults or weaknesses in the crust that accommodate motion. And it's this discontinuity in these rocks that set the stage for the next important event in the story of the Uinta Mountains. So while the amalgamation of these blocks was helping to build North America, globally there were entire continents that were colliding together. And by about one billion years ago these collisions had assembled a supercontinent called Rodinia. Using magnetic signatures left in rocks along with other evidence, geologists have determined where these modern where the modern continents of today fit within this ancient landmass. North America, which was once called Laurentia at the time because it contained parts of Western Europe, laid at the center of Rodinia and also straddled the equator. Antarctica and Australia were attached to what is now Western North America and more or less close to the location of the modern Uinta Mountains. This huge landmass existed at a time when there was primitive, mainly bacteria and algae life forms. And there were also no plants on the land, so it was a very different time in Earth's history. Now, like all supercontinents, Rodinia's existence was fleeting. It began to break apart around 800 to 750 or so million years ago. As the supercontinent was extended, the crust broke along normal faults. These breaks in the crust here shown in my diagram. And the normal faults accommodated downdropped motion in the intervening space, forming a basin. And these are known as rift basins. Sediment carried by rivers, streams, and sometimes wind began filling this depression, eventually reaching over 16,000 feet or 5,000 meters in th cumulative thickness. These sediments lithified into the rocks of the Uinta Mountain Group, and they contain rocks like conglomerate, sandstone, shale, and mudstone. This unique package of rock only exists in the core of the Uinta Mountains. Let's head out into the field and see these rocks up close and examine some of the evidence that helps us determine just how these sediments were deposited. 
Well, let's take a look at the Uinta Mountain Group here in an outcrop near Sheep Creek and see if we can look at some clues from the field to help us figure out exactly how this package of sedimentary rocks formed. What was the depositional environment? What processes laid down these sediments? Uh, as you can see, we're kind of up here looking at a nice section of these kind of red and buff colored uh, different beds in the Uinta Mountain Group. The beds are dipping gently to the right, which is to the northeast. And as we look at the rock a little bit closer, we can see that it's mainly a coarse grained sandstone. Some pebbles in here now and again, um, but mainly it's coarse grained. The grains are kind of subangular to rounded. And so there's a lot of different processes that can mobilize and transport sand of this size. You might have a beach environment. You might have uh, a sand dune environment where the wind blows the sand around. Uh, and then you might have streams. So there's a number of factors that might be responsible for transporting and depositing so much sediment. In other parts of the Winter Mountain Group, it does have some, some mudstones or shales, and there is some more conglomerate rich layers, but a lot of it's this coarse grain sandstone. This forms the bulk of what we see with the, with the, the Uinta Mountain Group. Um, but I think right here where we're at, there's a nice clue that tells us exactly how much of the Uinta Mountain Group was deposited, including these coarse grain sands. And if we look at this exposure right in front of us here, uh, this is the real smoking gun. This is the answer. So what you'll see here, and the, the oxidation of the iron here really kind of allows this to pop. In places, the Uinta Mountain Group is, is white, but in places it's very red. It's this maroon, reddish brown color from iron that's oxidized that forms the, the, the cement or some of the interstitial spaces between the sand grains. And what you can see right in front of us here are these arcuate curved beds. Remember the whole formation is dipping away from you. Here's the, the formation dipping back away from our view. But in this cross section view, we can see these curved surfaces that aren't quite parallel to the bedding. They actually cut across it a little bit. And these curved concave surfaces uh, truncate and then there's another one that begins and then they intersect in a lot of different ways these are all cross beds but unlike the steeper more planar cross beds we often see with windblown deposits like in sand dunes these are what we call trough cross beds so each one of these little curvatures here is a small little channel that was transporting the sediment but as the channel filled up with sediment um, it shifted and as it eroded laterally as it was moving a little bit faster on one side versus another it moved so it was moving both um, in three to, it was moving in three dimensions left and right and up and down as the sediment was being deposited and this is classic for river systems and when you see this many uh, fine cross beds just sort of all nested together this probably is a good argument for a braided stream system a river system that has um, channels that are anastomosing and intersecting um, and it's constantly changing over time but this exposure here is absolutely fantastic and a real, I think a real, really indicative of exactly what the depositional environment was for this part of the Uinta Mountain Group. And just some great field evidence as we look at these trough cross beds within this section of the coarse grain sandstone. So now we understand a little bit better how the rocks that make up much of the Uinta Mountains were formed. But how did the Uinta transform from a low area, a rift basin that filled with sediment, into Utah's tallest mountain range? For that, we need to pick up the story after the Uinta Mountain Group was deposited. Once the basin was filled and some period of erosion occurred, much of western North America was below or at sea level for a long period of time, stretching from the Cambrian period about 530 million years ago 
all the way to the Cretaceous period about 80 million years ago. During this period of relative quiescence, dozens of layers of sedimentary rocks were deposited across the region, one atop the other, forming many of the colorful and iconic rock layers found in Utah and other neighboring states. These rock layers buried the Uinta Mountain Group beneath thousands of feet or meters of rock. Beginning about 70 million years ago, compression caused by a subduction zone on the west coast of the North America created a mountain building event known as the Laramide Orogeny. This event pushed up many of the mountains in the interior west, such as the Rocky Mountains, Black Hills of South Dakota, Bighorn Mountains, and yes, the Uinta Mountains. Rather than form new faults, the old basin bounding faults that formed the rift basin were reactivated. These previous normal faults became reverse or thrust faults as they accommodated the compressive stress of the Laramide orogeny. In the process, the Uinta Mountains were born and the previously buried Uinta Mountain group present between these faults was pushed upwards. The younger overlying rocks were gradually eroded and eventually the Uinta Mountain group was exposed, forming the main rock unit present in the range today. Hope you enjoyed this fascinating story on the geologic history of the Uinta Mountains, why it's an east-west mountain range. Uh, appreciate your support of the channel. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. If you'd like to donate to the cause, there are links under the video description, as well as the thanks button located to the bottom right of the viewer. Thanks for your time.